the Lord impressed upon me that I should uh, have the theme for this year, uh, Roadblocks to Healing, and that I should teach from that theme. So everything that I teach is going to be dealing with roadblocks. And a roadblock is just something in the way. Amen. Amen. Something that hinders people from receiving. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of it tonight, then we'll do some things, you know, the rest of the week. But uh, in, in dealing with healing, I've been teaching this for many, many years. I've seen many people healed, and I've seen people not receive healing. And uh, I want to address some things pertaining to that. Because one of the major roadblocks and one of the first ones that I hear people deal with, one of the hindrances, has to do with God's will to heal them. They say that it may not be God's will for, to heal me. Or connected with that, which is basically the same thing, that God chooses whom he will heal. And I want you to see something tonight that will show you that that is simply untrue. Amen. It's not God's will for you, or it is, it's not God's will for you to remain sick. And God does not choose who he will heal. Now, I got at least a little amen on. God doesn't want you sick. But I got nothing but silence when I said, God does not choose whom he will heal. He doesn't choose that. I just stay quiet a minute to let that sink in. God does not choose whom he's going to heal. If it were up to God, everybody would be healed. And yet people find themselves pleading and begging and so forth with God and becoming frustrated and disappointed because things don't work out. And then they assume that it didn't work because God had another plan. You know, Christians are interesting people sometimes. Or let me just say church people can be very interesting sometimes because we think we have it all figured out and then when it doesn't work the way we thought it should, then we come up with an explanation. That's also not based on the scripture. And one of the things that people deal with is this issue of the will of God to heal. And I want you to know it doesn't matter what you have, how long you've had it, or any of those kinds of things, that is unrelated to God's will. How long a person's been suffering with a disease has nothing to do with whether or not God wants them well. I see I got you listening. Amen. You're not, you're not sick, you haven't been sick for a long time because God chose to teach you something along the way. Or that God was trying to humble you and all of these things. These are things that the religious world teach you. These are things that we hear in the church that are unscriptural. Let me say that just because you hear something in church or hear something from the pulpit or hear something from a minister does not mean it's from God. Amen. Say that again, Pastor Holmes. Why, thank you. Believe I will. I said just because you hear something, you know, in church from the pulpit or from a minister, doesn't mean that it's from God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I'm a, I, I like the Bible. I think we ought to stay with the Bible. Amen. If something doesn't work for me, then I need to find what's wrong, where did I miss it in the Word of God. Because I know one thing God don't miss. Amen. God doesn't lie, he doesn't miss, and he don't tell jokes either. Amen. And oops is not in his vocabulary. God don't have no oops moments. He doesn't have any moments where oh, I'm sorry, I meant to do something different. That's not, that's not with him. 
But I think if we're going to experience the healings and the blessedness that God wants us to experience, we need to find what his word has to say. And we're going to have to get rid of certain things. Now, for, for, for instance, the Bible teaches that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your life is really governed by your thoughts. And how you think has everything to do with how things turn out. Because your thinking is attached to your believing. If your thinking is wrong, your believing is wrong. I said if your thinking is wrong, then your believing is wrong. See, people have certain kinds of ideas about God that they think, things they think about God that may not be true, which causes them to believe certain things. For instance, there are many people who believe that God uh, controls everything. And nothing happens except God wants it to happen. That, that God is controlling everything. Everything happened by his will or his, his permission. And the way we say, the way people use it today and say, well, God permitted it, what we actually mean is that that's just a subtle way of blaming him. God's behind it one way or the other. It was either directly what he wanted or he allowed it to be for some reason. But it's still all God behind it. And when you really think about that, it makes no sense. I know that that's what we've been told in church for many, many years. But it's just unscriptural. It's wrong. The Bible doesn't teach such a thing. The way people talk, you would think there was no devil. I mean, what is the devil doing? Well, God's doing everything and running everything and controlling everything and fixing everything and making things happen. Well, what's the devil doing? Sitting back, twiddling his thumbs? <coughs> Jesus told us, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. If it steals, if it kills, if it destroys, you know it's the work of the devil. Yeah. He said, I am come that they might have life and that they might, ha might have it more abundantly. Yeah. Is cancer having life? Is heart trouble life, abundant life? Hmm? Is kidney problems, God, you know, abundant life? It's very interesting that if you see Jesus, uh, when you study the life and ministry of Jesus, he walked up on a man that was, uh, you know, crippled and messed up for 38 years. And Jesus asked the man an interesting question. Will you be made whole? That's interesting to me. I don't know, sometimes some Christians, we just read the Bible and just gloss over everything. I like to dig in. Why he say that? Why that happen? Isn't that interesting? Here's a man laying down there. It would seem obvious that, that he wants to be healed, wouldn't it? It would seem obvious. You would think the man, of course the man want to be healed. He's laying here at the pool of Bethesda, waiting on the troubling of the water, and the man even answered. He said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water's troubled. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Because, you see, an angel came down. The Lord sent an angel down. Now, those of you that have uh, the New International Version, they take out certain parts of that. They take out the part the angel stirring the water and all that. So there are some verses that, that they uh, leave out. But it's the Bible. It's still in my Bible. It wasn't a myth. It happened. Amen. Jesus said, now, Jesus said to the man, will you be made whole? Now, now, stop a minute before I, well, I'll come back to that. Will you be made whole? The man says, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another step down before me. See, the Bible said before that, that an angel went down at a certain season and troubled the water. And whoever went in first was healed of whatever disease he had. So it wouldn't matter what the disease was, how long the person had it, once the angel stirred the water, whoever got in first was healed. It didn't even say anything about them believing anything. Interesting. And, and yet God uh, was bringing healing to people. And this man said, I have nobody to put me into the pool. 
Now, it seems obvious that the man is there because in this place, there's a, a you know, great number of people desiring to receive healing. Jesus walks up on, this, on the crowd, looks at everything, looks at everybody, at, at this man, I'm sorry, and he says, uh, will you be made whole? Now, Jesus didn't even talk about the angel. He didn't talk about the water. He didn't bring up the pool. He asked him, will you be made whole? Now, while I said that it seems interesting that Jesus would ask such a question because it seems obvious, but yet it's not that obvious. What Jesus was trying to show him is that your will is involved. Will you be healed? Now, some people say they, they're willing and they want to be healed until they have to do something that takes more than three minutes to get it done. And then they get frustrated. I've been doing this for uh, three days and uh, three minutes and nothing happened. And see, their focus is on the wrong thing. Your, when your focus is on how it looks and how long it takes and how you feel, I want to tell you a little secret. You're, ex, you're exhibiting something called unbelief. See, it's countering your faith. But I've jumped ahead. I want to deal with this here about God's will to heal. Is it God's will to heal? Well, the only way we can find out is go to the Word of God. So let's go to passages that most of you already know. Isaiah 53, we'll start there. Isaiah 53 and verses 4 and 5. I'm reading from the New King James. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Now, now stop for a minute now. Look up a second. Now whoever this is that is referring to, well first of all, we can see whoever it's talking about he was wounded for their transgression. Right? He was bruised for their iniquities. The chastisement needful for them to obtain peace and well-being was laid upon him. And with his stripes, whoever they are he's talking about, are healed. Right? Now we're dealing with the roadblock. It may not be God's will to heal me. Or God chooses whom he will heal. It's saying the same thing because it may not be God's will to heal you, but he'll heal somebody else. And so we just come hoping and praying and praying and hoping and uh, just wishing and, you know, desiring and not obtaining. But now, I think it's important for us to stop for a minute and say, and look at that when it says, surely he hath borne our griefs. Well, who's the owl he's talking about? Certain people or everybody? Well, how would you know? Well, there's no hard, there's not a test. I'm going to show you how you would know. Hold that right there. Don't, don't lose it. Go over here to John 3. Let's let Jesus tell it. John 3. We all know this. We all learned this in Sunday school as little children. Amen. John 3. And 16, for God so loved the world. Now that would include who? That would include everybody. Is, or I should say, who would that exclude? No one would be excluded from this. God so loved the world that he gave. So his love for the world motivated him to give something. God so loved the world that he gave. Now, what did he give? His only begotten son. 
Now notice that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But then after that it says, in verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now that word saved comes from a Greek word, sozo. It's actually spelled S-O-Z-O, but it's pronounced sozo as though it was a deity. And that word sozo is the word that's translated here, saved. And it includes healed, delivered, in all of healing, forgiveness of sin, and all of those things, and deliverance from bondage is in that word. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have an everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be delivered, saved, healed. Well, well then, 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 because anybody that's in the world would qualify. How, dear, how, my dear brother and sister, can it be possible for God to send Jesus that whoever believes on him will be saved? Sozo. Saved, forgiven of their sins. Healed, healed in their bodies. Delivered from destruction. How can it possibly be that he sent them, him for that, and yet it not be his will? See, that doesn't make sense. How could you ever say it may not be God's will to heal you? If that's true, then you have to say it may not be God's will to save. You may as well say, it may not be God's will to deliver you. Are you listening to me? You can't say that you would have to separate. You'd have to take the word away. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't throw that word away. That word that's put in, in, that's in the Greek, that's translated here, saved, is the same word that's used in James. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, the prayer of faith shall save. It's the same Greek word. Now you know he's not talking about uh, uh, forgiveness of sin. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Now he's using the word save, but he's talking about healing. Yeah. Same Greek word. Amen. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He's not even condemning the world to sickness or to disease or to destruction. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, yeah. forgiven, healed, delivered. Now, if that don't make you shout, ain't no shout in you. How, how could it be? So, based on what we read in John, Jesus is the one that said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Then that tells me the hour that we speak of, that's spoken of here in Isaiah, is speaking about us. Because... You know Isaiah, what Isaiah is speaking here, though he wrote hundreds of years before Christ was born, he's speaking it under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and speaking it prophetically. Uh, 
All right, just hold that a minute. Just hold, hold that, hold that, hold that. We're we going to keep Isaiah. Let's, 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 we're going to leave John for a moment, but we, we hold in Isaiah, right? Go to Matthew. Matthew 8. Let's, we'll start at verse 14. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and served them. When the evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Whoa, does that sound familiar? We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Before that it says, surely he hath borne our griefs. That word griefs is talking about sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses. He has borne our griefs. If he has borne or carried our sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses, could it be possible that he wants us also to carry them? Then if it's not his will for you to carry them, it's his will for you to be healed of them. My dear brother, sister, you and I can follow in the steps of Christ even in suffering to some degree. But never, never do we do the same thing that he did in his substitutionary work. There is nothing that you and I can do redemptively in following Christ. We cannot follow his redemptive example. We have no holy blood that can wash anybody's sin. You could die on the cross for his glory. But you can't save nobody else by your dying on the cross. You just dead. And people talk about how wonderful it was that you were willing to give your life for Christ. But no one can be saved by that. See, there, we need to know the difference in following Jesus in his examples in his walk and it is in his substitutionary work. So you need to understand that. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And when you look that word up in the, in the Hebrew, the word sorrows there is talking about pain. So that means that really he, Jesus, took upon himself our pain and the diseases and sicknesses that caused it. If that's what he did in his substitutionary work, it is not possible for him to choose who he will heal. If God chooses who he will heal, then we have to take this out because it's not true. But it says there that he was wounded for our transgressions. That's all of us, everybody. He was bruised for our iniquities. Then you hear people say, well, God doesn't heal everybody. He doesn't save everybody either, but not because he doesn't want to. In fact, according to Jesus, more people are going to hell than going to heaven. I don't know if y'all read, read the Bible or not. But, but the, the narrow way has few. The broad way has many. Those that's lost will far outnumber those that are saved. And yet every one of them that's lost and every person who is in hell today went to hell against God's will. 
every one of them that's in hell today went to hell because of rejection of the way of escape. That's it. A way was made. But they rejected it. If the building's on fire and there's an uh, uh, exit, and it says exit is lit up, and everybody said, run this way, and you say no, <laughs> is it a great wonder that you burned up in the fire? But let me tell you what some people would th say. We don't know why God took our dear brother. That's what would be said at the funeral. God in his wisdom took our dear brother away from us. No, the man in his lack of wisdom refused to go to the exit when they pointed out to him. God gets blamed for all kinds of things, but it comes from the teaching, this demonic teaching about God's sovereignty. It's a demonic teaching about the sovereignty of God that makes God uh, uh, just controlling everything and doing everything. Nothing happens except he wants it to. That's, that's wrong. That's wrong. You just think about something just for a moment. You know, the Bible teaches that, that, that uh, it's appointed unto men to die. The only thing that God says is that everybody has to die. He does not arrange the method by which they die. If he did, then every death has to be attributed to him. No matter what happened, they were killed in a car accident, shot on the street, little baby hit by, a, a little three-year-old hit by a stray bullet. We would have to say God did that. And I'm here to tell you, if he did all of that, he's doing all these things, he need to be arrested. If you did that or I did, they would arrest us. What? God is not a criminal. God is not a killer. Amen. So we have to understand things happen for different reasons. Praise God. I was just reading on the internet. Uh, 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 about a month ago, when these young people were killed in a car accident, right after, you know, grad, young graduates, or well, they were about to graduate from high school. And they were out, and, and somebody, and this, whoever the driver was, just, you know, went over these, this, these tracks, and the car went airborne and flipped and did certain things, and they were all killed. Now, now, now that, that wasn't because God decided this is the day for you to die and you're all going to die in this accident because I'm going to inspire this boy to drive like he should. See, we don't like to hear this kind of stuff. I could jump and shout and run around and have you get excited, but I need you to think because you, you need to understand something because these things get in the way. These are the kinds of things that stop you from receiving certain mindsets and beliefs about God that are incorrect. And see, it's difficult to fight God. How do you fight God? If you think that it's his will for you to have the condition, you can't stand against it. Because to go against it is to go against God. And I believe people, they don't mean to be hypocritical, but they are, but they don't realize it. Until, you, you know, you have to... You, until you point it out to them. They said, well, you think it's God's will for you to be sick? Is it? Really? And you've taken medication? Why are you trying to get the doctor to help you go against God's will? If it's his will for you to be sick, anything that you do to relieve yourself, 
of that sickness is also to relieve yourself of his will. If it's his will. Now, now, now you don't get no fight from me because I don't believe it's his will. But for those of you that do, why are you going against him? People say, I'm, I, well, I got this sickness because, man, it's for the glory of God. Well, really? God's getting glory out of your headaches? Well, let him get more glory. Ask him for some real deep stuff. The kind of stuff that'll kill you. I mean, if he gets glory out of headache, boy, imagine what he get. Out of you shriveling up and dying from a bad disease. I know that sounds kind of rough, doesn't it? Well, that's all right. You know, sometimes you got to slap people into reality. <laughs> what you thinking? Now, you got to make people think. Because these are things we don't think about. We just embrace some argument with, with no merit. Let's go back to Isaiah for a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't go there yet. Don't go to Isaiah yet. We in Matthew, right? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmity and bare our sicknesses. Right? He took them and he bare them. So is it his will for both of us to have them? No. Then, then if he took it, then I don't have to have it. It may be a physical reality that I'm dealing with something, but I know based on his word that it's not mine and I don't have to embrace it. I don't have to have it. I can stand against it. I have the right to stand against it. It's not from God. If it's not from God, you know, hey, y'all read the word of God where it tells you uh, God have not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You can reject fear because you know that don't come from God. Well, if I know the sickness don't come from God, why don't I reject it? But if I think that it does come from God, I'm going to try to, try to have, instead of me resisting it, what I'm going to do is embrace it, though reluctantly, as I try to ask God for the grace to handle it. And see, then we get over into things where people start saying, God wanted me to go through this because he wanted me to help somebody else. Excuse me? Excuse me? Huh? Let me go over that again. God called you to suffer. Imagine that man at the pool of Bethesda. 38 years. He go around and testify. See the reason why the Lord wanted me to go through that so I can tell other people. It can be a long time, but one day after a while, maybe not when you want him, but he'll be on time. How many have ever heard that? All these religious things that we say and we come up with, things to argue against against the word of God. Amen. Against it. Things that, that, are, that are lies. Things that the enemy is using to keep you bound and defeated. Instead of you becoming defeated and discouraged and saying, it must not be his will because it didn't happen yet. You need to stop and say, well, what's wrong? and What's causing it to hold, be held up? Where am I missing it? Because God can't miss. The only one that can miss is me. So if indeed I'm missing, let me find out where I'm missing it. It's just that simple. And if I can find out where I'm missing it, and I will if I ask him, then I just make an adjustment. It doesn't matter how, how well you, your, 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 your intentions are. This, if you get out here and get on I-20 and go, uh, uh, go west, you may have desired to go east, 
but you're going west. The longer you stay on that road, the further west you're going. Now, 18 hours from now, you'll be in Dallas. Maybe shorter than that, depending on how you drive. You'll be in Dallas, Texas. You know, that, that road, it'll keep going. It wouldn't matter how, how well intentioned you were when you got on the road. Being on the wrong road by your own whatever, you know, you got on there. It may have been, you know, uh, an error, but it's still your error. I, I don't need to argue about why, I'm, why am I, you know, in Dallas and I was intending to go to Florence. which is east. You should get a clue if an hour passes, you ain't in Florence yet, but. <laughs> but if it's, if, it's, if it's really nothing, nothing's happening at all, it, it may make you say, well, let me see if I, let me check some things to make sure I'm not missing it in some area. And just make an adjustment. Now, what would happen if you drove all the way to Dallas? I mean, there's nothing you can do but turn around, get on the other side, and come back. But the good news is, if you stay on it, you'll pass here. Now, don't get off and say, I went and I tried that trip. It didn't work out, and I'm staying home. No. Keep going. Keep going. If you're on the right road, stay with it. Stop acting like a child talking about are we there yet? <laughs> stay on it, stay on it, stay on it, stay on it. I still, it, it doesn't look so good, but I'm staying on it. I may not feel so good, but I'm staying on it. I'm not going to zero in on how I feel or how I look. That's the thing that's going to defeat you. Are you here? Amen. Go to Peter. First Peter. Now we see what Isaiah, I mean what Isaiah said, and then we see what was written in Matthew, referring to the passage that we read in Isaiah. Isn't that right? Yes. Y'all read where it said that it might be fulfilled. We spoke about Isaiah the prophet. The traditional King James says Esaias, but that's just the way they did it from the Greek. But it's Isaiah. First Peter 2 and verse 24. Now, I'm going to read it from, again, like I said, I'm reading the New King James. Who himself bore our sins. By the way, do you have to bear your sins? Why not? Jesus bore them. If you and I bear our sins, we in trouble. To the left and straight down. Thank God we don't bear our own sin. You know, when you turn over to him. Who himself bore our sins. Now notice, in his own body. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. In his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Is that in the Bible? I said is that in the Bible? Did the Bible say by whose stripes ye were healed? All right, it did it? Yeah. Well, were is that past tense, present tense, or future tense? Yeah. That's past tense? Well, if it's past tense, then it already happened. Yeah. Well, if it already happened, I'm not trying to make God do it. Yeah. Help me, Lord. Yeah. I, I'm trying to get this thing over to you. Are you listening to me now? See, we got to see these verses. He was wounded. That already 
it happen. He's not going to get wounded again. He was bruised. That already happened. He's not going to get bruised again. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. That's not going to happen again. And with his stripes we are healed. That's not going to happen again. The Lord doesn't have to do one single thing for your sins to be forgiven or for your body to be healed. It was already done. And we don't find anybody begging, oh, Lord, please save me, Lord. Save me, Lord Jesus. I mean, you know, some places they will beg them, but anyway. But save me, Lord. <laughs> save me, Lord. Save me. Some people, if they don't know any better, keep coming to the altar to get saved. You know, because they're uncertain, because they haven't been taught or trained. But, but you don't keep getting saved. You don't get saved over and over and over and over again. Hallelujah. You got saved. If I need forgiveness, I'm, I, it's already paid for. My forgiveness has been taken care of for sins past, present, and even the future. Well, if that's true, what about my healing? Same thing. It's been taken care of past, present, or future. If I got to deal with stuff later, it's already handled. If I'm dealing with stuff now, it's already handled. And stuff I had to deal with before, it's already handled. I don't, it's not a new disease, new sacrifice. Same sacrifice going to take care of you that took care of the other thing that was bothering me. Glory to God, I've done it again. Woo. Preach myself happy. Whoa, hallelujah. Are some of y'all in a coma? <laughs> hallelujah. If I just get a hold of our, I think I got it. Now let's go back to Isaiah. Verse 4, Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs. He got it on him. And I'm going to get back into the other thing in a moment. But he got it on, he carried it on him. Our griefs. Our sicknesses. Our weaknesses. Our distresses. Hallelujah. He carried it. He carried it. Glory to God. He, born our, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, our pain. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten to, by God and afflicted. But what we didn't realize, he was wounded. My God, my God. For our iniquities. I'm in the hour there. Because it said God so loved the world. This includes not only the people of that day, but the people of today and tomorrow. And the wonderful thing about that is that Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. You would think. If in fact, and I'll come back to that in a second before we close. But if you would think that with all the multitudes of people that Jesus ministered to, if God chooses whom he will heal, that he would at least in three and a half years run upon at least one case where it wasn't God's will. And yet there is not one single case where he ever told anybody that it was God's will for them to be sick. So where the preachers getting it from? Where the church people getting it from? That's why most of the people in the congregation believe like they believe because of the unbelieving preachers.
full of roast beef and unbelief. Amen. And teaching all that stuff. Praise God. That's, that's, the, that's the issue. Where, where does it come from? Stop and ask yourself a question. Why do I believe? First of all, what is it that I believe? And then why? And if your answer is, oh, I just always believe that, then you need to change. Oh, why do you believe what you believe? You need Bible. I was sitting with a group of pastors, and we were having a discussion about healing. And, and uh, you know, I was the only one, really, I was pushing everybody. seemed like everybody was getting well, One pastor, he was there. He, he thought he was helping. Until one question came up, and then he looked at me and said, Doc, you're on your own now. <laughs> time I was in here. None of them know what they talk about, and you don't either. So I asked the question, listen, name me one case where Jesus told anybody it's not God's will to heal. So one pastor stood up, or, uh, and he, well, he said, he pointed out, he said, the woman who came to Jesus and her daughter, the Syrophoenician woman, her daughter had a demon and all of this. And he told her, you know, it's not meat to take the children's bread and give it under dogs. Now I go back and read it, first of all, before I even get into what my argument was. But you go back and read that. He said, let the children first be filled. You know how to read, don't you? That's number one. But here was, I didn't even go there. I just said, listen, well, let me ask you this one question. When the woman left Jesus, did she have what she asked for? Yeah. Well, either it was God's will for her to have it, or Jesus went against God's will. Now, 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 I, I don't know, but in my Bible, it says, I am the Lord and I change not. In my Bible, it says, once I've spoken, I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. I, 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 and that's isn't my Bible. Is that in yours? So, so it could not be that God does things against his own will. You know how we'll do things like that? We'll say, well, against my better judgment, I'm going to go ahead and do it. God doesn't have any of those things. Now, God has given people what they wanted because they wanted it. And he said, you want, really want that? Like the king. You don't want it? Now, let me help you what's going to happen. But one thing God won't do is violate your will. That brings to, 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 uh, to the discussion again what Jesus said to the man. Will you be made whole? And I know personally that I ministered to people that didn't want healing. Amen. And, and, and uh, one man was healed instantaneously. He had his, uh, he, uh, uh, a nerve in his hand had been severed. And he was, had no feeling in his hand. And the Lord had me to minister to the man. I said, hold your hand out there. And I slapped both hands, with both hands. And he yelled out, ow! Feeling came in instantly. Well, I went back to the same place a year later. I said, how many of y'all are here that were healed last year? And he was sitting on the drums, and I looked over there, and I said, young man, were you not healed? He said, yeah, yeah, said, yes, sir. I'll talk to you about it later. <laughs> this really happened. I'm not making this up. You know what he came and told me afterwards? He said, I, 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 I did get healed, but, you know, I, I get a check for that. I don't want nobody to know I got healed because they'll cut my check off.
See, now you know I'm not God because right there you'd have lost it. I was God. I take the healing right there. You can't have it now. And uh, when, when the checks are less important than the healing, I, I, I'll give it back to you. I see you go on away from me with no feeling in your hand. But collect your check. I've had other people I minister to, and I said, well, what about this condition here? Well, that's all right. I, I can deal with that. You know, uh, uh, I just. Somebody came and wanted prayer for their stomach. I prayed for them, and, and, and they, obviously they were limping. And so I said, what's wrong with your leg? Let me, oh, that's okay. I don't, I don't need nothing for that. If I, could just, if I could just get healed, this one little thing, I'd be all right. And, and bear the rest? Huh, Jesus? Because you're trying to do a job, I may as well call you him. Surely he has borne. It is not possible, I'm trying to get you to see, that it is not possible that if he has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. That we, uh, that, that it's his will for us to carry them. Huh? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. But now back up a minute. And go into that 52nd chapter. And, and uh, we pick up in verse 14. Or verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. This is God speaking of his servant, Jesus. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Oh, my God. Listen, this is speaking about Jesus and his condition on the cross. See, the Bible, we read over there in Peter where it said that his own self took our sins in his own body on the tree. You see what happened? is that when Jesus took sin, you see, he got on the cross to, to pay for our sins. And so the sin was all, all sin was laid upon him. He never committed a sin. But the Bible said that he that knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so he took it on. But in taking on the nature of sin, he had to take on also what happens as a result of sin. If there had never been a sin, there'd never been a sickness or disease. The wages of sin is death. Sickness doesn't come as a thing to keep you company. It's trying to kill you. Some of it slowly. But even if it's not a terminal illness, if it's something you got to keep suffering through year in and year out, you still have no quality of life. Did Jesus come for this purpose? To let you have that? No. When he took it upon him, when he took sin into himself, his whole body and face was disfigured. That's what it's talking about here. With, and it says his visage or his, his face was marred more than any man. That means it, it was disfigured beyond anything any man has ever experienced. It, was, it had such an effect on him that his actual form was marred as well. His, he was disfigured on the cross. He wasn't pretty. 
and just a little drops of blood falling down his face. He looked like a mass of bleeding flesh. He was unrecognizable as a human. And it didn't just come from the beating. They, never, they didn't beat him to that, to that point. But when sin, when he took it on, good God Almighty, every sickness, every disease, include that would ever come on earth, just like he paid for every sin that would ever, that would be, ever be committed on earth. Did he pay for all our sins or some of them? Then why do I have to have it? It may not be his will. That's wrong. And since we're in the 21st century, we ought to have a little more revelation than David did. Thousands of years ago. But even he said something. Amen. In the 103rd Psalm, go ahead and look there with me. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. How do you bless God? How do you bless him? Praise him. That's how we bless him. By praising him. By worshiping him. That's how we bless God. And he says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's in me. Bless his holy name. Verse 2. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Oh, glory to God. What, is it, what are his benefits? Who heals most of your diseases. But, huh? What's wrong? No, I, hold on, I'm sorry. Who heals the diseases that the doctors have a cure for? Excuse me, I'm, what's wrong? No, who heals all your diseases? That's it. All your diseases. Wait a minute, before that, who forgives all your iniquity? How many of your iniquities? The real ugly ones? The ones that don't seem so bad? All. Oh. How can he forgive all your iniquities and heal all your diseases and yet he sometimes chooses who he will heal? Impossible. Either the redemptive plan of God includes healing and forgiveness or it doesn't and it does because everything we see show it but not only that always you see healing and forgiveness of sin going hand in hand you remember Abimelech he wanted a he's going to have Sarah Abraham's wife And, and, and uh, the Lord told him, you're a dead man? Wasn't that Abimelech? Amen. You are but a dead man. Because Abraham, you know, said that this is my sister, and she said so also. And, 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 uh, and, and the Lord said, you, you're dead. And not only that, all the people, all the women, you know, their, their womb locked up. They couldn't have children. When he told him to repent, give her back, then let the man pray for you. And you get healed. He got healed, and everybody else that had an issue got healed. Notice the forgiveness once the repentance had come. And the healing was hand in hand. Right here in Psalm 103, we see hand in hand who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Well, how much is excluded from all? You mean even mine? But I've been suffering a long time. And you ain't the 
only one suffering a long time. That, that man in, in, at the pool of Bethesda didn't argue with Jesus about how long he'd been there. The Bible said when Jesus saw him lie, knew that he'd been now a long time in that case, he said, will you be made whole? Interesting. Are you willing to be healed? Go down deep inside you. There are people who are not willing. They say out of their mouth that they want to be healed, but they love the attention they get being sick. Will you be made whole? They like how people fuss over them. They were looking fine, and then soon as company come, or somebody come around, they get a different look. <laughs> Turn on the pitiful. <laughs> Could you get me some water? <laughs> you were just up at the refrigerator 30 minutes ago. <laughs> so, I, it sounds funny, but I'm telling the truth. Will you be made whole? Will you be healed? Are you willing? Some people are not willing. People saw right here, I ministered to a woman who was a, had a MS, multiple sclerosis. She's in all kind of pain and so forth. She's suffering bad. I ministered to her right here. And healing came. And she left out of here and went and did something I still couldn't do right now. I mean, I could if I, you know, get my wind up. <laughs> went and rode a bike for six miles. But she stayed away from the word. See, I, I, I know, I know, I don't, I don't mean to, this is not going to be political politically correct but it matters where you go to church alright so I ain't gonna hunt. say it again well thank you believe I will y'all told me to say it again so it matters where you go to church and the only reason why that is, it matters what you hear Jesus said take heed what you hear and even you, you can get healed and have something great happen and get talked out of it over time Amen. Get talked out of it. You don't want to experience it. Well, after a period of time not hearing, if I'm going to church every day and all that, you know, I can hear good, nice things, but, but I don't ever hear anything to reinforce what happened. Like, like the woman that was in the church in Spartanburg, and I ministered to her years ago, and she had cancer, and she was taking radiation treatments and chemo and all of it. And she had just come from a treatment that day and, and came to service. In fact, she was invited by someone else who had, was healed from, in the, from a stomach condition. And they kept on her. And she said, I didn't want to come. I, she just kept on. But she, the woman came. And I ministered to her. And I didn't know what was wrong with her. I didn't even ask her. I didn't ask anybody. It was a line of people. I didn't stop and pray and talk to each one. I just laid hands on each one, just touched them, and kept going and kept going. And the power of God was moving, and, and people were falling on the floor. And, and afterwards, I turned the mic over to the pastor. I was going to the office, and I had to step over people to get there. When I got in the back there, I heard someone hollering, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed of cancer. And I came back running out. And when I came back out, I, I saw this woman with her hands raised, praising God, saying, I'm healed of cancer. She went back to the doctor. They couldn't find any cancer in her body. No trace. Now you could tell me it went in remission. Really? 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 Instantly, huh? But here's, some, here's the key. Her pastor taught healing as well. And for a period of time, those people, the doctors would have her come back, and they would put a light up inside of her and looking, trying to find anything. But she was healed. I saw her over 10 years later, still healed. Never had any more treatments or anything. 
What was the key? What she was hearing. She was able to sit and hear somebody reinforce that word. But you see, the, Jesus taught that to take heed what you hear. You see, to him that have shall be given. And to him that have not will be taken away even that which he have. In other words, what that actually means is, if see, the word is seed. If I sit and hear the word and that word gets watered, it's going to bless me and it's going to keep growing. The word grows in you like a seed. Just as what Jesus said. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. That's talking about how the word actually grows in you. And, and the more I'm in it and, and watering it, the more it's being exercised, the more I'm, you know, I'm growing. And it's growing in me. The scripture says, so mightily grew the word of God and increased. And it's growing in you. But if I go sit and, and, and hear somebody just a little bit, you know, God is God. And sometimes it's not his will. Yeah, somebody ought to say amen to that. <laughs> and I just keep going hearing stuff like hearing that little by little, talking to, you know, Grandma and, and Aunt Susie and everybody else. And the child, please, yeah, baby, that, that ain't. Church, you just got to be careful because that runs in our family, you know. See, I start hearing, hearing all that kind of stuff, hearing all that kind of stuff, and tell me about everybody in the family history that had it, and, and, and now you got it. And you know, you, try, you know, you got to pray, but you know God sometimes, he works miracles sometimes. <laughs> See, what have they done? They've taken it away. So the woman came back a couple years or so later. Men are to do it again. This time, didn't get a healed instantly. So I took her in my office. Me and my wife took her in the office and ministered to her and showed her different things and took 30 minutes. I ministered to that woman 30 minutes. Well, she walked out of here praising God. Stayed away for a while. God is merciful, isn't he? Came back again. I said, I'm not going to minister to you like I did the last time. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to just come and sit and listen. See, I mean, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure out. You get something, and a little while later it's gone. You get something, a little while later it's gone. That something need to be fixed. Amen. And I know, I know exactly what needed to be fixed. I knew how to help her. But people aren't always willing. Sometimes you tell people to do something, well, they want to know if it's easy. Well, I want you to do X, Y, Z. A woman in Chattanooga, I, I prayed for, ministered to, who was, had suffered four strokes and five heart attacks. Now, when I went there, and I believe the same woman, that I went there one year, and I'm ministering, and the Lord told me to tell this woman I was going to be there three nights a week for the whole month, Wednesday through Friday, every week I was going to be there. And I told her, the Lord told me to tell her, if she will come, tell her if she will come in here and not miss that by the end of the month she'll walk as good as you. And that's what I told her in front of everybody that was there. Do you know the first time she missed that did it? Now, why would somebody miss? They don't believe it. And no, and no way in the world you really believe it's God and you're going to change or come up with some excuse some reason why you can't like I was at a service and I, I was talking we was talking about this service how tremendous it was and, and, and this pastor spoke up and she said, uh, she said you know oh, I, God told me to go there God told me to be in that meeting but I just couldn't do it what and that's a question mark with an exclam exclamation point at the end of it. What? God told you, but you couldn't. How is that possible, please? Now, God could tell you and something get in the way and you take the path of least resistance. Some people, any kind of resistance come. They give up. 
It's called a faith fight. It's a fight. Now you can stand in the ring and get punched all over every place and just punch the person in the glove with your face. <laughs> and just stand there and get knocked out. You still in the fight. You may not be participating. So you just taking a beating. If you don't participate, you're going to take a beating. But when you take your stand and say, wait a minute. See, the woman that, that uh, I told to come, she didn't come. A year later, I went. And this woman had five years in the, in the thing now. The Lord is merciful. And she got healed that night. But think about this. She suffered a whole year longer. Because she was unwilling to do certain things. It may cost you something. That's not because God make it, you know, makes it that way, but it may cost you something. You may have to spend time or money to do some things. It costs you to take a vacation. You still take it. Why are you looking at me in that tone of voice? It costs you to buy gifts at Christmas time. If you ain't got no money, y'all still go, go do it anyway. Credit cards. Just bow down and say charge. So sometimes people are unwilling. The woman I was talking, I spoke about earlier, she was unwilling to do that. So she's still not healed. The Lord wanted, gave her a way out. But it's going to cost something. It's going to mean you're going to have to just come. I didn't say you have to join our church. Just come. Just want you to come. Sit down. Don't wait. Just not on just first Sunday. Come and sit and listen. Now ask, you, ask yourself a question. Suppose a person was sick in such a way that they couldn't get out. And, and they couldn't go out at all. How much church would they miss? As long as they're there, they'd be missing. Would it mean anything bad happened? Was bad, you know, in, in, that they did something wrong? No. So I'm not telling you to leave your church and come. I'm just telling you to sit and listen. Because I need to get enough in you that you know what to do with it when you get it. If you don't know how to resist, you're going to be overtaken. And I'm not going to go through the same thing again and again and again for you to go away and come back. Once you get that word in you, after a while, you know, once you get the, really get the word in you and you start hearing wrong stuff and you got a hold of the word, you're uncomfortable there. You, you ain't going to stay there. Amen. Not if you got any sense. Praise God. So it is not the will of God for you to be sick. Say it. Make it personal. It is not the will of God for me to be Say it again. It is not the will of God for me to be Say it like you mean it. It is not the will of God for me to be Let the folk down the street hear you. It is not the will of God for me to be Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 It is not the will of God for you to be sick. 